Okay, so real quick, one more time, sandwich theorem. I have three functions, one's on top, one's on the bottom, and I have a messy guy in the middle. If I can figure out the limit of the top guy and the bottom guy, if they match, then the guy in the middle must have that same limit at that location, and that's what that's talking about. So again, direct substitution doesn't work for this. So what you're going to do is start with something that you know that's a fact, and we know that any cosine graph of x, or 1 over x squared in this case, has to bob and weave between negative 1 and 1. So that's the first thing you're going to start with. And then it's a matter of making it match. So now make it match. That's your step number two. So you're going to multiply. I'm looking at what this was. I've got this part of it. I need an x squared included in that, and it's being multiplied. And technically, I have three parts to this inequality. I have the left, the middle, and the right. And each part, remember algebra balance, has to, have this, has to be multiplied by that x squared. So negative 1 times x squared, the middle times x squared, the 1 times x squared gives me this statement. And once you have that statement, then the last thing to do is take the limits of the ends. Take the limit on the left and the limit on the right. See what they're doing. That's like your top and your bottom what we're looking at up there. So the limit of a negative x squared, plug it in, is 0. The limit of an x squared is 0. They match. Since they match, then the guy in the middle that squoze in the middle, is that a word? Squoze? Squoze in the middle. I know that that's also going to have a limit of 0. And that's what the sandwich theorem, squeeze theorem is talking about. So that was the first question that he did. Second question he did was something like this. Um, G and H are functions defined by, they give you the functions. If F is the middle guy, what's the limit of F at X equals 2? So at 2, you're going to figure out the limit of G of X at 2, I get negative 3. The limit of, of H of X at 2, plug it in, I get 5. They don't match. They're not like this guy was 0, 0. So you can't make any conclusion for what the limit is at 2 for that function that's in the middle. The squeeze theorem doesn't apply because you get two different answers. They have to be the same answers for it to work. All right, number three, same idea. You've got two functions, a g of x and h of x. What's the limit of f of x? Well, let's check it out. Figure out what g of x is doing at 0. You get 3. h of x at 0 gives you 3. They match. Squeeze theorem applies. Therefore, your limit is 3 for f of x. Okay, for the last one, numbers 4, 5, and 6, same idea. I've got f and g and h are functions. They give me what the functions are. All of the following inequalities are true. State whether the, each inequality can be used to, with this. Does the squeeze theorem apply is what it's saying to you as x approaches 0. Well, he didn't quite, he's talked about this, but he didn't quite use the notation maybe that he should have. So I'm going to show you the notation. I'll come back to this comment I have up here in a second. All right, so what you need to do is take the limit of all three pieces. Remember, keeping algebra balanced, whatever you do to one side, you've got to do it to all places. So he did not do this notation, but really probably should have. Um, the limit as x approaches 0 of negative 1 half, the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x, the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared plus 1 half, and then literally take those limits. He jumped from here to here when he was doing the notes online. I would say Mr. AP would probably prefer to see that you know what you're talking about, that you're taking the limit of each piece. All right, so negative 1 half was your first piece. There's no x for you to plug it into. It's just a negative 1 half. This you can't evaluate yet because you don't know what f of x is. And this guy, you're going to uh, plug in a 0, you get 1 half. So can the squeeze theorem be applied? And the answer is no, because these don't match. So I just changed the color so you could see the difference. Like, I, I was afraid I was going to run into the boxes. So this one is in red only because I didn't want it to, I wanted it to look like a separate problem. All right, again, I took the limit of each piece, limit of x, negative x cubed, the limit at g of x, and the limit of x cubed as x approaches 0. If I plug a 0 and I get 0, if I plug a 0 and I get 0, therefore the squeeze theorem applies, the limit for g of x would also be 0. And the last one, same thing, the limit of 1 minus x squared, limit of h of x, and the limit of x squared plus 1, all as x approaches 0, gives me a 1 on either end, and the squeeze theorem applies. The one thing he ended with was talking what I have over here in green in my margin. 
And that's when you've got functions that are unbounded. In other words, they go to either positive or negative infinity. You can't apply the squeeze theorem. That's going to be something that you're going to learn in Calc BC, how to evaluate those types of things. But um, for this, it's considered unbounded. And I'm going to talk more about that in a couple minutes with some of our examples. But it's like the 1 over x graph that can't touch this graph that's on my wall. The 1 over x graph that goes towards infinity. I'll just draw a quick one right here so you know what I'm talking about. If I ask you for what the limit is as x approaches 0 for the 1 over x graph, well, if I approach 0 from the left, I'm going towards positive infinity. If I approach 0 from the right, I'm going towards negative infinity. That's the one that's considered unbounded, what they consider unbounded. You can't apply the squeeze theorem because you don't know what infinity is, so you can't sandwich anything around it, right? That's going to come up in a couple of the homework problems, the fact that they're unbounded. Okay, so questions from the video that I just summarized the whole video, I think. I think we're into practice, yeah. So um, that was kind of my version of what I took from the video. Anything else that you guys picked up on before I show you some examples? Okay, so we're going to the practice problems, and I picked, picked a few here. Let's see. The first one I picked was number two. And number two says, um, evaluate each limit. And I can tell you numbers one, two, and three are all done this same kind of way. So in order to do the limit, you kind of have to build towards what this is saying. I don't know what an x squared sine of one over x squared is going to do. But I know one fact. So I'm going to start with a fact that I know. And the fact that I know is that this sine of one over x squared always bobs and weaves between negative 1 and 1. So I start with a fact that I know. And then I'm going to build it to match what the actual function is that I'm trying to look at, which is x squared sine of 1 over x squared. So all three parts have to get multiplied by that x squared. That's going to give me a negative x squared is less than or equal to the sine, oh, whoa, 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 hold on, is less than or equal to uh, x squared sine of 1 over x squared is less than or equal to 1 times x squared is x squared. Well, now you got the middle matching. So now you can apply the squeeze theorem, sandwich theorem, and now you're going to take the limit of the ends. So I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 0, because that's what they have in the original of a negative x squared. And I'm going to come on the right and I'm going to figure out what the limit as x approaches 0 is of a positive x squared. And if I can evaluate them, then maybe I can determine what the middle's doing. So plug it in, direct substitution. 0 squared that's negative is still 0. 0 squared is still 0. And so since the ends are both zeros, that means the middle guy must also be zero. So I say, therefore, my three dots, therefore, the limit as x approaches zero of x squared sine of one over x squared also equals zero. And numbers one and three are done the exact same way. I'm watching the chat, so if you have a question as we go, just holla. Okay, number five is next on my list, and it says you got G and H functions defined by yada yada. If F function is in the middle, I can tell that from the inequality. Um, again, this parameter here, negative two, uh, is less than or equal to x, is less than or equal to zero. That does not come into play in what we're doing. It's just there to, to tell you that you're narrowing in and only looking at the graph in that area, but it's not going to affect any of your problem solving for this. The question is, what's the limit as x approaches negative 1 for f of x? So you got to check out what g of x and h of x are doing. So if I were to look at this, there's a couple different ways that I could do this. You could evaluate your g of x, evaluate your h of x, the limits, 
and see if they match. I'm going to do it as the big long inequality thing. So I'm going to write it this way because I'm, I'm going to do the math here. So limit as x approaches negative 1 for my g of x function for the cosine of pi times x plus 2 has to be less, oh, minus 3. I didn't see that guy. He's hiding. Minus 3. Has to be less than or equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 for f of x. Has to be less than or equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 for my h of x function, x squared over 2 plus x minus 7 halves. Whew. That's a big old long thing. Well, then I'm going to plug it in and see what happens. I'm going to evaluate the limit. Direct substitution is my friend on this. you got to think of your unit circle, too, right? Do you remember that? So if I plug a negative 1 in for x, well, negative 1 plus 2 is 1. 1 times pi is pi. So the cosine of pi, I have to think of where pi is on my unit circle. Go around the unit circle, my coordinate is negative 1, 0. Cosine is the x guy. So if cosine is the x guy, it's the negative 1. Negative 1 minus the 3 on the outside gives me negative 4. Did you catch all that? I don't know quite what the middle's doing yet, so I'm going to keep that is as it is. And I'm going to go to the right and see what the right comes out to be. So again, direct substitution. Negative 1 squared is 1. So now I have 1 over 2. I have a negative 1. And I have a negative 7 halves. I have to think about what that's going to equal. So I get a negative 1 half and a negative 7 halves gives me a negative 8 halves. Negative 8 halves is a negative 4. And I say, woohoo, I know for sure. Therefore, the limit as x approaches negative 1 for f of x has to be a negative 4 because it's sandwiched between the other two. All right, I want you to try number seven. Same kind of question. G, of H, G, of, G and H are both functions that they give you. F is between the two. What's the limit as x approaches negative two for f of x? So take a minute and see if you can find for me that limit. All right, let's see. Here's my number seven. 
So I took the limit of all, well, of the two ends. On the left side, I got five, and on the right side, I got six. Well, they're kind of close to one another, but there's a whole lot that can happen between five and six. So that means that because they're not the same number, the squeeze theorem does not apply. You can't use it. You have no idea. There's not enough information for you to be able to determine what it's doing actually for f of x at negative two. He said on the vi video to say, the limit cannot be determined, correct? So the squeeze theorem does not apply, the limit cannot be determined. There's not enough information, exactly right. All right, so um, yes, that would be good wording. I'm looking to see if there were directions that said anything specific. So the squeeze theorem doesn't apply. Um, do you need to put the three dots? No, probably not. Maybe I'm being an overachiever there, <laughs> putting the therefore there. Yeah, um, I don't know. Probably that's from my old school habits. So I don't think it's, it's certainly not something Mr. AP needs to see the, the three dots with the therefore thing. So good question, Ms. Maddie. All right, we are flipping over then to uh, the next page. There's two more from this section that I want to do. Number 10A. And then I want to look at um, 11D. So 10A is next. Look at all the wording with this, right? When you look at what they're asking you to do. Let f and g be functions defined by, and they give you the things, two functions. The following inequalities are true for x when x doesn't equal 0. State whether each inequality can be used with the squeeze theorem to find the limit of the functions as x approaches 0. So the wording of this is the wording you would see probably on your AP exam. A lot of gobbledygook words, right? A lot of verbiage of math there. But really all they're asking you to do is find the limit as x approaches 0. See if the squeeze theory actually is going to work. So I want to know what the limit as x approaches 0 is for this guy. I want to know what the limit. I'm not going to rewrite this whole statement, so I'm kind of cheating here the limit as x approaches 0. So for each of those pieces, we're going to take the limit because that's how you apply the squeeze theorem is by taking the limit of each of the pieces. All right, so for this first one, I'm plugging in direct substitution of a 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 times pi is pi. Sine of pi, got to think about what that coordinate is again at pi, negative 1, 0. Sine is the y value, so it's 0. And 0 times 5 is 0. So on this n, when I take the limit, I get an answer of 0. Less than or equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x. I don't know what f of x, well, I do know what f of x is, but I want to see if it's going to work. So it's sandwiched between the other two. And the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 fifth, there's no x for me to plug that into. So it's just 1 fifth. And when I look at my answers on either side, it doesn't sandwich between there. You don't have the right numbers. It has to match in order for it, you to be able to apply the squeeze theorem. So the squeeze theorem does not apply. That was the question. Does the squeeze theorem apply or not? Squeeze theorem, I'm going to abbreviate THM, does not apply. State whether each inequality can be used with the squeeze theorem to find the limit. And we said no. That one doesn't work. All right, last one from this section is 11D. 11D says, again, you've got all this math verbiage going on here. Uh, let f and g be functions. The following inequalities are true when x doesn't equal 0. State whether each inequality can be used with the squeeze theorem to find the limit of the functions. So again, you're seeing if you can apply the squeeze theorem to these. So what you're going to do is take, again, the limit. It's the same question we just did. I want to know what the limit's doing as x approaches 0. I know that because it tells me right here that it's x approaches 0, so I know which one I'm using. For each of these three pieces, in order for the squeeze theorem to apply, I've got to take the limit of each of these pieces. And so I go to do direct substitution. I'm like, oh my, that's not cool. 
write zero denominators. I can't have zero denominators. So it's going to be an indeterminate form for those, an undefined fraction. If I think about what the graphs look like for this, so maybe I could look, look at it visually, right? This guy's the can't touch this graph. He's over here like this. And when he becomes negative, now he's down over here and up here. He changes locations. So as I approach zero for this guy, it's unbounded. Right, it goes to infinity and negative infinity. And if I go to look at this guy, what it's doing at zero, the one over x graph, same thing, it's unbounded. So he, throw, he throws a couple of those examples in that he kind of talked about but didn't actually show you. So it's unbounded for both of these as x approaches zero. So for one of the, I'll just put it for one of these, as x approaches zero. And as x, approach, as x approaches zero. So can you apply the, the question is, um, state whether you can use the squeeze theorem. And if it's an unbounded situation, it does not apply. So your final answer is, because of what their question was, the squeeze theorem does not apply. Okay. I think you will see that come up. Yeah. Do we have to write all that, or can we just write now? Uh, state whether each, you could say no. <laughs> just say no. <laughs> yeah, it just says state whether it works or not, right? So yes or no. Does it work or doesn't it work? Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, questions from that before we get into 1-9. And Catherine, do I have a preference for what you say? Mm, the limit can't be determined. Squeeze theorem doesn't apply. Whatever. It's all, it's all good. Whatever you like. All right. One eight is bye-bye. We are going to one nine. I thought one nine was super duper easy. Hopefully you guys did too. So he kind of was just recouping and reviewing different things with, uh, with limits. So he showed you three linear function type examples and said, uh, which of these, now you have to watch the wording of this. I found this in the video and I don't know if you noticed this. Some of them are, he was asking for where the limit does not exist. And some of them he was asking where the limit does exist. So really watch your directions on this. We want to know in this case the limit does not exist. So the question is, for which of these examples does it not work? So you've got an ABC situation. So the first thing that he, and these are all linear functions, that's important for you to know as well. So if I want to figure out if the limit exists, I need to know what it's doing from the left and from the right of five. So I do direct substitution in to the first one I get nine. Second one gives me nine. Therefore, I know that the limit exists at five and it's a value of nine. But they want to know where the limit does not exist. So the limit exists and so my answer is no. Middle guy, if I come at five from the left, I get an answer that would be four. You have to think about the slope. This is where the linear part, the fact that this is a linear situation, um, helps you to, to get to the next point. So the, if I'm at 5, it would be a value of 4. If I come at 5 from the right, it's a value of 1. And so, again, I'm looking at slopes and such, and so the limit doesn't exist. They want to know where it doesn't exist. This answer would be yes. And then the third picture is just the normal graphing picture. From the left of 5, I get a value of 4. To the right, I get a value of 1. They don't exist because they're not the same value. Again, I'm looking for where it doesn't exist, so my answer is yes. And then the last example he did was, all right, how about something that's like this, that we don't have any algebraic manipulation that we can do to it? We can't factor that. We can't um, do that conjugate thing because it doesn't have roots. 
So he said, all right, well then just plug in a number that's going to fit that's, that's to the left of 4, 4 to the minus. So to the left of 4, well, if I'm at 4 and I think to the left, then I'm at 3.999, something like that. He went to thousandths decimal places. That's good. That's perfectly fine. And you plug it in. Do a plug-in of a number that's a little bit less than 4. And so when I do a plug-in of that, I end up getting a value that's a negative 1. And so that would be um, my answer. A lot of times with absolute value graphs, let me just kind of go on a little tirade over here in the margin. If you think of the absolute value graph, right, it looks like this. It's all about the slope, right? That's what the, the, the um, when you're thinking of limits and derivatives and such, you're thinking about what the slope of that line is. And if you think about the slope of the line, if I am to the right of zero, think of my slope for this, right? Absolute value of one is one, absolute value of two is two, absolute value of three is three. And when I plug these points in, that's how this point, the coordinates would be going. So I have a slope on this side that equals one. And if I go to the other side, on this side, if I put in a negative 1, I get 1 in absolute value. If I put in a negative 2 into my absolute value, I get 2. If I put in a negative 3, I get 3. And so this time, my slope on this side is a negative 1. And so you're going to see a lot of answers for these problems in this section when they involve the absolute value that you get an answer that's either 1 or negative 1. That's kind of where it's coming from, is the fact that you've got the slopes of those sides are either 1 or negative 1. OK. Just a couple more examples, and then we're going to call it a day. So you are flipping to the practice part of this. And we are looking at number 6 is my first one. Now, I don't even think you really need a calculator to do these, but you can if you want. This time I'm coming at negative 1 from the left. So think about that. If I'm at negative 9 and I'm to the left of negative 9, is that negative 8.999 or is it negative 9.001? Which one am I using? Ain't nobody answering? Hopefully you say a negative 9.001. There you go. Thank you. Negative 9.001. And then I'm going to just plug direct substitution into this, right? I'm just doing the direct substitution. And again, I believe you can probably do this without your calc, but uh, this is not a decimal point there. Oh, come on. Okay. Negative 9.001 plus 9 in absolute values. Well, this would give me on top a negative 0.001, right? And on the bottom, it's going to give me the absolute value of negative 0.001, which gives me a negative 0.001. They divide out. This is a positive on the bottom. Negative over positive gives me an answer that's negative 1. And there you go. OK, next one, you flip over. I want to look at number 8. And again, you've got to really watch these directions. So in this case, in number 8, let g be the function that's decreasing for all these values except where x equals 0. Um, I've got the limit as x approaches 3 of my function is 6. Which of the following could represent the function of g? OK. So I need to figure out what these limits would be at 3. So in order for this one in a piecewise function to have the limit, then as I come at it from the left and from the right, they have to have the same answers. So I'm going to check it out. I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 3 of, let me see where you can see me here. Um, of this guy. Now I'm going to factor this in the process because if I do a direct substitution of 3, I can see that's not going to work. It's going to give me a zero denominator. So as I'm writing this, just to save me a step, I'm going to take that top and factor it. So I need two numbers that multiply to 6 and negative 6 and add to negative 1. You'll have an x minus 3 and an x plus 2. 
you kind of have the clue there. Remember what the denominator is. Chances are that might be one of your groupings and your factors. All right, so bang, bang out, x minus threes, they're gone. Direct substitution, three plus two is five. Cool. Well, the other side is six. If I take the limit as x approaches three for the other part, it's just a six. There's nothing for me to, to put in there. So the question says, which of the following could represent the function of g? And this one is no. This one is not going to work for you, right? The limit does not exist. So my answer to the question is no. The next one is a chart. And again, I'm going, checking it out from the left and from the right. This one does not say it's a linear function, so I don't kind of have to figure out what the slope is. I just have to look at the numbers. So as I approach 3 from the left, the limit as x approaches 3 from the left, these are g of x functions, they're calling it. Well, as I get closer and closer and closer to 3, my answer is 6. If I take the, let me move this down a little bit. If I take the limit as x approaches 3 from the right, that's coming this way. My y values are getting closer and closer and closer to 5. So the limit doesn't exist. Which means my answer again is no, because it's could, could this be? And the, the answer is no, it can't be, because the limit doesn't exist. And then C, let's check it out. This one, the limit as x approaches 3 from the left. From the left, I get a value of 6. Just reading the graph. The limit as x approaches 3 from the right. Reading the graph, come at it from the right, I get a value of 6. And this one is a yes, it exists. OK. So they're taking you on a journey looking at piecewise functions, looking at tables, and looking at graphs to figure out what those limits are. Watch the directions, because if you get down to number 9, Number nine is asking you where they don't exist. Your work is the same, but your answer is going to be different. That's all I've got to tell you for these guys. So let's go back to our schedule for the day, make sure we got done what we wanted. We did. Uh, Got all the notes done. So by tomorrow, you're going to finish up the rest of 1.8 and 1.9 and submit those. Again, you have off on Monday, but I will see you again on Wednesday. And Wednesday, I want to take questions from anything. We're going to go over 1.8, 1.9. There's a review worksheet that's due for Wednesday so we can go over it. So need to have that work, worksheet done for uh, Wednesday. It's posted. I posted it last night or something. So review worksheet you want to have done so that in class on Wednesday, 9 o'clock, we're going to talk about the answers to that. I'll take any questions on anything from the unit. Due for Thursday is the mastery check. That one you need to be working on. That one's a quiz grade. Again, if you want to turn that in early, I can check that and then give you um, feedback so that you can make corrections before it's actually due. Email that though. If you want me to make the correct if you want to if you want me to check it so that you can make corrections, make sure you email it to me rather than submit it through Google Classroom or submit it in Google Classroom and send me an email saying check mine please. Because um, if it's just posted in classroom I'm not going to know to do that. So you need to shoot me an email if you want me to check your answers. And then our test is next Thursday. Um, when we meet again next week. Questions before we go?